uh, this week, we're going to continue the series we began um, back at the beginning of January called Giving Back to God. And we kicked off uh, this series acknowledging uh, that God wants it all. Everything that we have, everything that we are, God wants it all. And then last week, we leaned into that a little bit more uh, by examining how God wants our time. And this week, we're going to spend some time exploring the reality that God wants our talents. So, my question is, have you ever observed someone doing uh, something, um, that a particular activity, and you thought to yourself, man, that person is doing exactly what they were made for? Out of all the things they could be doing, the fact that they're doing that thing makes complete and perfect sense because that's what they were made for. On Tuesday morning, Al Braca began his work day um, at his office on the 104th floor of one World Trade Center. He'd been a vice president, a bond broker for Cantor Fitzgerald for 16 years. However, according to Al's wife, Jeannie, Al really hated his job. He couldn't stand the environment. He said it was a world completely out of sync with his Christian values, but he would not quit. He was convinced that God wanted him to stay there, to be a light in the darkness. He was on the phone that morning when an ear-splitting explosion happened beneath him, and the person on the phone with Al heard people yelling, evacuate. And in the background, then the phones went dead. And those were the last words spoken by Al Braca to anyone who knew him well. A plane had hit several floors below at about the 90th floor. Cantor Fitzgerald's offices were above the crash site, and most likely, people in Al's office, they, they became trapped immediately. And many people, as the nation saw in news reports, they were trying to get to the roof via windows and ledges because the heat and the smoke were penetrating the upper floors rapidly, but they didn't make it. Most likely, Al and his colleagues were trapped, and they couldn't go down to get out. But back when the World Trade Centers were bombed in 1993, Al, he was there helping his coworkers kind of get down. It took three hours to get everybody down, and people would pass him in the hall, and they'd yell, hey, pray for us, Rev. And he'd respond by telling them that he had it covered. He stopped along the way and prayed with people who were upset or nervous. Even some of his coworkers, they kind of, they taunted him, but they came to respect him, and they admired what he had. But this time... On September 11th, 2001, after the plane hit his tower, according to some of the spouses of Al's co-workers who, who had died with him, the Rev got everybody in his circle, holding hands, praying. and It's understood that some people received the Lord for the very first time. And as usual, Al thought of others more than himself. He stepped into eternity, ready to meet the Lord face to face bringing with him some of those he had prayed with in those last few moments. And because Al knew who he was and how God had wired him or gifted him, he was absolutely equipped. He was made for that moment. Here's the truth. God has uniquely equipped each of us who follow him for his unique purposes in this life. God, again, is the main attraction in this life, and our talents and abilities are meant to be surrendered to him and used by him in order that God alone receives all the glory and honor in everything that we do. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4-7, through 7, we, we read this a few minutes ago, we heard this, but Paul writes that there's Different gifts, but the same Spirit that distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There, there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. Now, now to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit. It's given for the common, common good. See, when it comes to using the gifts and the talents that God has given as a gift to you, as followers of Jesus, unless 
You find a way to use those gifts and abilities in a way that honors God. Your life will always have this, this God-shaped void or this, this vacuum, and you'll never find authentic fulfillment. And so I want to be really upfront about this. When, when Paul writes that there are these different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, he's making it very clear to the church back then in the first century, and he's making it very clear to the church here in the 21st century that all these different gifts, these different abilities, these talents that come to us, they come to us from God. They don't, they don't belong exclusively to us in the first place. And these different gifts, they're, they're different. He, he seems to be kind of hang on this difference. But why in the world would be this need for different gifts? A little bit later on, in that same chapter, in verse 14, Paul says this. This is really, really key. He says, even so the body is made up of one part. It's, 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 really, it's really actually made up of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, uh, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Be. But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where, where would the body be? See, the diversity of the human body, it's incredible, right? The connection here is that the human body's diversity is also reflected in the church body's diversity. Our church, our church has been equipped by God to reflect these different abilities to accomplish one purpose, God's purpose for our church right here. Now, a question that might be forming in your mind is how do I determine? I hear you talking about these gifts. How do I determine what gifts God has given me? How do I know for certain that God wants me to use those gifts. Or you might be thinking this, but Rob, I'm not sure I, I'm ready or know enough to be used by God. Some others may feel like, no, I have been hurt before in working or serving in the church. I don't know if I want to go through that again. And yet, there's still others of us who are just, we're just kind of tired. There's a well-known Bible teacher by the name of Warren Wearsby, and this is what he says. He says, we're all born with different interests and abilities. And when we're saved, we were given different gifts. He said, I believe God matches spiritual gifts with natural abilities so that we can fill the place that he has for us and do the job that he wants us to do. So with that in mind, this idea that God has something that he wants us to do, for those of you who maybe have questions about your gifts, for those of you who wonder if, you've, if you even have them and that they make a difference, let me assure you, let me assure you that God says they do. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says this, for we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Additionally, I also know what it's like to have committed my gifts and my abilities that God's given me, blessed me with, to a church or to a ministry, only in the midst of that to feel maybe discarded, maybe taken advantage of, and to be emotionally, physically spent. And if that's where you are, I, I understand. We really do want our church to be a place where you can answer God's call 
to those gifts and how you use those gifts. To be deeply loved by our church and the Father in heaven. And then finally, to experience all of that as a, as a cup of cool water, refreshing water. Whatever, whatever circumstance, whether you know for sure what you are made to do, whether you're not sure, whether you're tired, I'd, I'd love to talk with you as you try to live for Jesus, to explore the way that God has uniquely gifted you to serve our church, to serve this body, because our church needs you. And something else that I think is important to wrap your heart around as we explore this idea that God wants all of our talents is a truth that can't be denied, and it's this. You see, there's many reasons that God saves you. You know, to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons that God saves you is because he's fond of you. He likes, he likes having you around. He thinks you're the best thing to kind of come along the pike in quite a while. And if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he'll listen. He could live anywhere in the universe but he chose your heart. And we just celebrated the greatest gift at Christmas provided to us at Bethlehem. Here's the truth. God is crazy about you. He truly is. And it's because of God's very specific plan for us that we've been gifted with the gifts, the talents, the abilities. That we have. And for those of us who've made the decision to follow Jesus, nothing we do can we claim is completely out of our own making. Paul makes a point of reminding us, reminding the church, even in the first century, something that we would do well to remember in the 21st century. He says this. He writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. And this is actually in direct opposition to what we often come across in our own culture. Jesus' followers are the very last people who should say, my body is my own. I can do with it what I please. If we were bought at the price of Jesus' life in exchange for ours, then even our own bodies don't belong to us. So let's keep looking at this uh, truth that comes to us about God wanting our talents. Looking at verse 7 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where the apostle writes, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Paul is writing to make it clear that God alone has claim to the gifts that we have. They all come to us from the Holy Spirit in the first place. And not only are these gifts purposed for the common good of the body, they're actually meant to kind of build us up. So again, I want to ask, as I think about common good being built up, what's that look like in everyday practice? Well, here's an example. Over the last quarter of the year, there have been a group of people here at the church with the assistance and on-site coaching of the Southern Michigan Conference of the Free Methodist Church. They've been gathering to collectively seek, clarify what our church is uniquely called to be and to do in this moment. We've been working hard to capture what it is that we sense God's equipped us for here in this community and beyond. And that's not to the extent of saying everything that's happened before doesn't matter. That's not what we're saying. What we're wondering about, what we're seeking, what we're 
praying about, what we're working hard is, what's the next season look like for us as a church? Here's the, the good news. Jesus is not intended for us to be alone in this, but for all of our community to work for the common good. All of our community, meaning our church, and just how we can have a greater impact for the sake of the gospel. It's not about being a, just a great club, having cool programs. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. When he talks about here the manifestation of the Spirit in this verse, what does that look like in our own lives? What does this manifestation look like? in our own lives. I would suggest this. God has prepackaged you with various strengths and abilities. This is something I came across that I thought really spoke to this really well. From Max Lucado, he says this. When you became a child of God, the Holy Spirit requisitions or requis requires requisitions from you. He takes from you. He summons, is a better way of putting it, your abilities for the expansion of his kingdom. And these abilities become spiritual gifts. And the Holy Spirit can add other gifts according to his plan. But no one who comes to Christ is gift-deprived. And not only you're not gift-deprived, you're not alone. We're part of a community. That's why Paul talks about the common good. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Wayne Brower who teaches in the religion department of Hope College in Holland, Michigan. And this is what he had to say about this idea of these common gifts, this common good that God has called his church to work toward. He says this, and when I'm surrounded by other people who are wanting and thinking and doing the same things, he says, I belong. I belong to Christ. And I belong to others because they also belong to Christ. Community becomes a reality, not out of our ability to get along, but because of our ability to be connected to the same source of thought and of power. And the reason why we do that is so that God receives all the honor, all the glory in everything that we do. And here's ultimately what it goes back to. God wants it all. He wants all of your talents. He wants all of you. Because that's how much he loves you. Would you pray with me? God, we desire that you would receive all the honor and the glory that is due. God, sometimes it's hard to remember that. Lord, we get distracted. We get wrapped up in what are sometimes being selfish, sometimes being self-centered, not thinking about you first. It's really easy. God, help us to be the kind of people who recognize nothing we have is because of our goodness. Nothing we have is ultimately because of our own power. No, God, everything that comes to us comes to us from you because that's the kind of God that you are. That is the kind of love that you have for us. It is because you sent Jesus to walk among us, to live and to die. But even beyond that, God, the most important part of that is that Jesus conquered death and the grave and made that promise to each of us. And so as we give you our all, because that is what you want, may we remember God, this great exchange, the exchange that allows us eternity. 
We love you. We thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.